<clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Management Committee. Uh, my name's Councillor Rick Cheadle. I chair the committee. Um, and I'll just go round the table here so that those um, at the back can understand who's here and what role they're playing. So if I could start. Uh, thank you. Good morning. My name's Catherine Bowen. I'm the Deputy Monitor Monitoring Officer and uh, Deputy Head of Legal here to assist the committee. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. My name's Dara White. I'm the Head of Democratic Services and for the purpose of committee meeting today will be the meeting administrator. Thank you. Councillor Terry Southcott, British Award. I'm the Vice Chair of this committee. Uh, Jacqueline Houselander, um, Head of, sorry, Head of Development Management um, and Lead Officer for this committee. Hayley Easter, Senior Planning Officer for West Devon and South Wales. Uh, Tony Leach, Oakhampton North. Caroline Mott, Bridgestow Ward. Steve Guthrie, Drew Stainton Ward. Alistair Cunningham, Buckland Monocorum Ward. Jeff Moody, Tavistock North Ward. <laughs> Sam Wakeham, Hatherley Ward. Neil Jory, elected member for uh, Milton Ford Ward. Ursula Mann, Tavistock North. You all, uh, apologies for absence. Chair, we have no apologies. We're a full house. Thank you. Yeah. Um, declarations of interest in accordance with the code of conduct. Members are invited to declare any disclosable pecuniary interests other registrable interests and non-registrable interests, including the nature and extent of such interests they may have in items to be considered at this meeting. Are there any interests anyone wishes to declare at this stage? Councillor Jury. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to declare that uh, as leader of the council in the previous uh, council, I was invited to the Sculpture School, which is uh, one of the subjects of uh, our, our, our deliberations today to an exhibition that they were mounting there um, and I've met the uh, the owners in that capacity. Um, it was obviously I, I found it really interesting. I don't think it will affect my ability to make a decision on the planning application in any way. Thank you. That's Lamont. Thank you, Chair. Um, I also have to declare an interest in that I have visited the site on several occasions in my capacity as mayor um, when they had exhibitions. And so I have therefore met with the applicants, but the, the, obviously the conversation never came around to their application. Thank you. Um, and just to clarify, clarify that they are personal interests and both members may participate in the committee item. Uh, items requiring urgent attention. Uh, there are none that I'm aware of, so we'll move on to confirmation of the minutes of the meeting held on the 27th of February. Uh, hopefully all the committee members have read those. Are there any issues anyone wishes to raise? I'll take those as a true record of the meeting then. Thank you. On with uh, planning applications. We have two to consider today. Um, the Sculpture School at Bondley and a housing development at Beer Alston. And we'll start with the Sculpture School, which is 005424 full. Uh, tension of three holiday lets in the form three holiday lets in the form of two shepherd's huts, version of an attic space above the sculpture school, and the addition of photovoltaic panels. I'll ask the planning officer to lead on with the report. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. So this application is, as Council just said, uh, the retention of three holiday units in the form of two shepherd's huts, an apartment, then the addition of solar panels and EV charging points. So this is the wider site location. The site is outlined by the red pin and then the red rectangle. So the site is east of Bonley and southwest of Broadwood Kelly. It runs alongside the A3124, which connects up to Winkley and down towards North Taunton. There are no site designations for this area. 
This is the site location. So you can see the existing sculpture school building, which is this building just here. This was a uh, previously granted consent in on the 2nd of March 2016. So that was prior to the adoption of the joint local plan policies we have before us today. There is an existing other building within the site, which is here. And then this is an existing car parking area and hard standing. The access is here from the A3124, uh, which is as existing. The proposal is in four parts or the application. So I've added the red arrows just to show you where everything is within the site. So the access comes in through here. You've got three EV charging points shown in the existing parking area. The solar panels are proposed for the south of the existing school building. Battery storage inside as well to facilitate the panels. The holiday accommodation in the form of uh, the one bedroom apartment is located here within the first floor of the existing building. You can then walk or drive and walk through to the other car parking area and then you can walk down this pathway into the field where the two shepherd's huts are currently sited. This is all within the existing and previous red line boundary of the previous application. We'll start with the solar panels. So the existing elevations are here for the south and then I've drawn a red line around so you can see where the panels are to be sited. The proposal is for 16 um, solar panels at 430 watts. And um, like I say, they're on the south elevation. These are the elevations relating to the one bedroom accommodation proposal. So the existing north elevation is here and then obviously you've got the steps, you've got some steps here, another stepped access and some additional windows in this elevation. On the south elevation you've also got a set of stairs shown here, so they're the differences in the solar panels as we've already shown. On the east and west elevations you can see the stairs access again, additional windows and doors on the east and west elevation here. There are no proposals to any of the other parts of the existing sculpture school building. This is the existing ground floor of the sculpture school. There are no proposals to this part of the building. This is the first floor for the accommodation, so you can access it through either set of stairs um, and then it's a one bedroom with live-in dining kitchen area and, a, and an integral shower room. If you walk down the stairs here, you can get down to some patio and seating areas. These are the shepherd's huts. There's two of these style. They're blue in colour. They have, they're quite small in their size. They provide kitchen at shower room, bathroom and some seating area here. There's also a stepped access. These are the photographs to access the site. So you can park in this secondary parking area. There are signs existing. You can walk through the parking area. Is pedestrian access only round to the huts? So through this gravel pathway here. These are the two huts that are currently in situ. There has been some recent tree planting as well. And then there are some additions of fences and domestic additions around the the huts, you've got a gravel pathway leading up to both. And then there are some domestic pot plants, lights to guide visitors to the huts. This is a photograph taken from the applicants, well, the website for the sculpture school. The link is there so you can see what the huts look like in an evening setting. And then the same with these two. So these are external to both of the huts. They both have a decking area, a seating and a log fired bath or hot tub. The accommodation above the sculpture school, this is the pathway to access the secondary set of stairs on either side. It leads round also some new planting as shown there. This is the west elevation looking east towards the accommodation. You can see the stairs in situ. And the accommodation is above this part of the building here. This is the existing sculpture school alongside. Another photograph showing the stairs access. 
just another one there so you can see both sets of steps and the windows. This is the seating area and then stone wall which has been erected within the site and then the patio areas on site as well. The solar panels, this is the existing south elevation, so the proposal is to pop the panels along this part here. So for I've added the policies into here so we can explain those to you. So there's some key policies here. So SPT 1 and 2 provides the background and overarching policies for sustainable development and to achieve balanced communities within the plan area. TTV 1 and 2 are both relevant and they aim to put growth through the hierarchy of settlements. There's four tiers of settlements. The site is located in the bottom tier, tier four, so countryside. And as such, that then defines down to TTV 26 and 27. TTV 26 is relevant and um, it focuses development within the countryside. There's two parts to this policy. One is for isolated development and the second is for all proposals being assessed under this policy. We've applied both because of the location of this um, of the site. And then Dev 15 is relevant as it looks to support the rural economy and um, it does look into expansion um, of existing businesses, but it has to be subject to impacts on the environment. We have regard to all of these policies, as you'll see in the officer report, and we've weighed the benefits and come to the decision we're at. So the key issues are the holiday accommodation. Obviously, the existing sculpture school has permission. The unsustainable location of the existing site, and obviously there is an on-site existing business. There are some economic considerations for the holiday units, and they are the key policy considerations. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I'll now open up uh, for questions from the committee. I'll start with one. Um, in your report, there is reference to four um, uh, um, shepherds huts. Yes. I, I know there are only two here, mm -hmm. um, but we I just want to be absolutely clear. We're not considering four, we're considering two. Yeah, that's correct. Some of the submitted documents made reference to four, but the description is for two. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from members of the committee? OK, thank you. Um, we've got um, all registered, sorry, three registered speakers. Um, Stephen Sherry, who uh, has got some slides to show. Got those. Um, Dr. John Ware. And a statement to be read out by Councillor Casbolt, who's the ward member. So we'll start with uh, Stephen Sherry, please. I give you a generous three minutes to make your case. Um, Mr. White will we'll signal when, uh, we'll time you as it were, and signal when your three minutes is up. So whenever you're ready, press the button and please start. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you to those members who were able to make the uh, site visit last week. As you can see from this first slide, there are a lot of trees on the site. In, across the whole site, there's one and a half thousand trees. And there are 500 trees just in this one field, in it and around it. Up slide two, please. Shepherd's huts have been built to a very high standard and furnished. They're quiet, they're tranquil, there's no TV, there's no Wi Fi. It's aimed at a very different sort of audience. Slide, please. Three, please. This is the uh, rear conversion, call it the artist Garrett. Again, very attractive onto a very high standard. Yeah. <clears throat> the only reason for refusal relates to users being reliant on private car. In the reduction, carbon reduction statement, uh, we demonstrated that students staying on site rather than traveling backwards and forwards from hotels in the area, save over 4,000 road miles. 
which is an average of 4.8 tonnes of carbon a year. We've also included PV panels. That produces a surplus of 6,000 kilowatt hours a year of electricity. So we've effectively got carbon credits on the site. People don't always come by car. Only a couple of weeks ago, we had a student from the Netherlands came on Eurostar to London, train to Exeter, and a bus dropped her right at the front gate. There are six services a day past the school. Accommodation isn't suitable for families. They're only occupied by single couples or individuals. They do come for either to do a course or for holiday. It's a tranquil rest place. They read a book, they paint. It's not used as a base for tourist attractions in that area. There aren't really many. They don't really leave the site. There is a fully fitted commercial kitchen and dining area in the main studio building, providing three meals a day. No one needs to leave. The main policy that's relevant is DV15, supporting the rural economy. Quite clearly says avoid a significant increase in the number of trips required by private car. And I'll emphasize significant because Devon County Council as the highway authority have not raised any objection to this development. And if there had been a significant increase, they certainly would have said so. There are only a couple of slides now which will show the sort of work that's done there. The lady in a diving posture, uh, that's uh, recently been publicised not only locally but nationally and internationally. There are three sculptures on the icon of the seas, the largest cruise ship in the world, recently launched in Miami. Okay. Now, thank you. Right. The use of the three units of holiday accommodation for students and holiday makers form a modest but necessary part of the income for the site. There are eight people who work here. Uh, for many businesses in the West Country, especially rural businesses, it is not just about making a good living, it's about survival. This is important to them and their business going forward. I request that the application is supported. Thank you very much. Uh, members of the committee, questions for Mr. Sherry? Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Um, about the accommodation for the students, but when I look on the website for the school and the individual website for the accommodation, the implication is that anybody can book them. Is that the case or is it purely for student use? The, the students have priority. They tend to book well in advance because they're coming on a course and the courses can be from as short as a week to a whole year. And we have had people come for a year. Um, <clears throat> so they have the priority. Any weeks not taken by students are then available for other holiday makers. You've got a fantastic resort there. It's got to be used. It generates just that little bit of extra income that makes the whole project viable. Any other questions from members of the committee? Uh, Councillor Jury. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stephen, for your presentation. Um, could you very briefly just tell us a little bit more about uh, what I perceive is the, the national and international reputation of just school. Um, how important is it and how important is it to this part of West Devon? They've done commissions for the Queen. We could have slide five if that's possible. Thank you. So slide four. Done the David Bowie sculpture in Aylesbury, the Duke of Wellington Regimental Memorial statue in Halifax. These, these are statues that go all over the world. And to have someone like this on your patch should be really proud and encouraging of what they do. I mean, this that website shows hundreds of items that are on are on display in public places. Any other questions from members of the committee? No? Thank you very much. Thank you.
Our next registered speaker is Mr. John Ware of Bondley Parish Council. Uh, you're welcome to stay where you are or come up here. Choice is yours. Okay, Dr. Ware, as I explained before, you've got uh, three minutes and um, your time will start when you, you start. Could I just introduce myself first? I'm Dr. John Worry. I was a general practitioner in North Taunton, as some of you know. Um, I retired 17 years ago. Uh, I'm chairman of Bondi Parish Meeting and um, I'm actually here both on a personal capacity and, and as a representative of the people of Bondi. Um, and... Um, I've previously been involved in student politics 50 or 60 years ago, and, and I've also trained as a lay preacher. So if you think I'm preaching at you, please, please forgive me, and I'm hopeful that I will not uh, cause any offence. I'm going to assume, and I know this is wrong, I'm going to assume that none of you have actually been round the, uh, Andrew Sinclair's um, building and scene, but I, I gather two of you had. I've known... Um, Right. I've known Andrew Sinclair for eight or nine years now since he first came to Bonley, uh, and I would count him as, um, among my friendship group, and uh, we get on very well together. So what I'm going to say is quite personal, um, and what I'd like to say, um, if this is a three-point sermon, I would like to ask for recognition, I would like to ask for respect, and I would like to ask for support. Um, if you do go into Andrew Sinclair's um, studio, you will be immediately impressed by the quality of his work, some of which has been shown. He's a former member of His Majesty's Armed Forces, and when he demobbed, uh, he had some, found something to do as a sculpture, and, and he had an unknown talent which he's developed. Uh, when you see the work that he's produced, you will see he has a fantastic respect for His, his Majesty's Armed Forces, and he also, as the slide shows, has a phenomenal respect for the royal family of this country. And I believe that um, that respect needs to be recognised, and I believe that's the sort of thing which in this day and age needs to be supported. And I think that in future, people will say that St Ives as old, um, Audrey Hepburn, Barbara Hepburn, and Bondi will have had Andrew Sinclair. I, I'm glad he's not here, of course, he'll blush when I say that. And I, I am sincere in that. When you stand in front of the statue of the Duke of Wellington, you are standing in front of a human being. You are seeing the work of, of a phenomenal um, sculpture who has managed to capture the real humanity of that person. It is quite astounding the quality of his work and uh, we should be enormously pleased that he's come to stay here with us. We should recognise that. We should recognise the respect that he shows for, for the work that he does and we should recognise the respect which he's gained uh, from the armed forces for what he did for Halifax. That's very important. Um, so as an artist, he is also a very well-versed military historian. Uh, and the Duke of Wellington, which is his monument, um, is as a sign of the respect which he shows and the way he can demonstrate this is quite amazing. Um, he's also an anatomist. As a doctor, when I went on one of his courses, I was amazed at his knowledge of human anatomy. So his sculpture is based on Greco-Roman sort of uh, things, and it's based on things which are emphasised by the likes of Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. I'm not saying he's up there with those, but the, the basis of what he does is based upon that. It really is awe-inspiring. He's also an educator. He's been recognised by people who've been on his courses who are themselves lecturers in education. That he well, is a superb... You Thank you. Um, may I finish, if I may, with the words of Brigadier Andrew Beek, CBE. The committee could not have selected a better artist for this commission. Andrew Sinclair has more than met the original brief 
and for this the committee is forever grateful. I would ask you for. Very much. You just stay there for a sec, just in case there are questions from the committee. Uh, are there any questions for Dr. Wah? Oh, OK, thank you very much. Uh, the last submission is um, a statement to be read out by um, Mr. White from Councillor Casbold. Thank you, Chair. The statement is actually a joint statement Councillors Watts and Casbolt and reads as follows. Good morning, fellow councillors. Unfortunately, neither myself or Councillor Watts are able to attend in person to show full support of this application. I'm working my day job and Councillor Watts is overseas on compassionate leave. Years ago, West Devon Borough Council agreed without hesitation to allow the conversion of some animal housing to be converted into the building that is now the Sculpture Schools building with acclaimed international sculpture artist, Andrew Sinclair. We now find ourselves in a position where the school needs our help to maintain their business by allowing students to stay in accommodation on site by using shepherd huts. What is could be more quintessential in the British countryside than a shepherd's hut? These huts do not look out of place and in no way spoil the countryside or views. By allowing students to stay on site and self catering, it will no doubt reduce daily travel to and from hotels and B&Bs and reduce costs for the students. With EV charging on site, this will also reduce carbon emissions. We draw your attention to some references in the JLP policies SPT1 and SPT2. Policy SPT1, delivering sustainable development. The local planning authorities will support growth and change that delivers a more sustainable future for Plymouth and South West Devon. Development and change we planned for and managed in accordance with the following principles of sustainable development. One, a sustainable economy where, little one, opportunities for business growth are both encouraged and supported, and little two, environmentally conscious business development takes place. Surely it is more sustainable and in keeping with the countryside to use a shepherd's hut. Policy SPT 2.10 provide a positive sense of place and identity including through the recognition of good quality design, unique character, the role of culture and the protection and enhancement of the natural and historic environment. By approving this application, the sculpture school can move forward and thrive. By refusing, you could be doing undoing all the years of great work and international recognition already gained and thus putting in doubt not only the school, but the future of fantastic students. Summarise. Councillor Watts and myself wholeheartedly support this plan application, and we hope that you do too. Kind regards, Councillors Mike Casbolt and Louise Watts. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. White. Um, we've heard um, three submissions. I just wonder, before we move uh, into sort of general questions and debate, whether, as a result of anything you've heard, you've got any comments or questions for the officer. And I think um, Ms. Hanslander would like to say something as well. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think um, having heard all of the submissions this morning, I think it's pretty clear that the Sculpture School is of great importance. And um, I don't think as planning officers we are um, denying that. And obviously it's got permission and it's there um, and we're very supportive of that. But what you are being asked to consider today is the accommodation for that school. So. So whilst there's been some some very good um, accolades provided to us, you just 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 wanted to make sure that you consider you consider the application based on the accommodation that's being requested, not the sculpture school. Sculpture school is there. We're very proud that it's there, but it's the accommodation that you need to be considering. Um, I also wanted to make the point that um, the parish council um, bond, so because the site is on the edge of three parish council areas. We consulted all three parish councils um, and one parish council had no comments to make and the others didn't respond. So that, I just wanted to clear that point up um, before you go into your debate. Um, and I think okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we've we've sort of had questions. Um, sorry, Councillor Leach. Thank you. Based on what's just been said, one of the questions that came up last week was whether those that's going to be tied in with this 
school. And I think you were going to wait to see what legal said. So have you answered, please? Yeah, we've had a discussion with legal, so we can condition. So, so, so for my ears, so it can be conditioned if this is given permission? Yes, yeah, it can. That's fine. Okay. Sorry, I've just got one more, one more point to make, um, um, and it's relating to the policy considerations, really, of this application. Clearly, SPT1 and SPT2 are the overarching strategic policies which promote sustainable development, and there are arguments within those policies which, which pull both in both directions. So, yes, there, there are um, uh, positive um, elements of this proposal that meet the policy, and there are also um, negative parts of those policies which, which go against the proposal. Um, similarly, with policy DEV 15, um, which is the rural economy, there are elements of that policy which seek to support rural development, which is which is right and correct. Um, but also there are elements of that policy which, again, pull in a different direction. So um, I'm, I'm very conscious that West Devon members, uh, West Devon Development Management Committee have raised in the past issues with regard to policy Dev 15 and how officers balance the difference between the positives and the negatives for each scheme. So um, in, in coming to the conclusion today, um, which we both agree is finely balanced, we have tried to make sure that both the positive and the negative parts of that policy have been considered. Overall, obviously, the recommendation is for refusal, but that's based on a, a very broad consideration of the policies in the context of what I've just said. OK, thank you. Well, we're now in debate. Councillor Moody. In, in my debate, could I just refer to the previous planning application that was refused in 2023? Would you like to elaborate on the, the reasons why, which is for the, basically the same application? Yeah, so the we had a previous application last year. It was refused under delegated authority. Uh, there were three reasons for refusal. One is the principle, which is similar to today. One for landscape and climate emergency, which we've overcome through the submission the landscape appraisal and then the solar panels and EV charging points, but the development in both are, are the same with the addition of the solar and the EV charging points. But yeah, it was refused under delegated authority last year. Anyone else got views they wish to debate? Absolutely. If this was a new application for the school, under the policies it would got, they wouldn't give permission. I think we could all agree. For, for me, we gave permission back in 2014 or 15, whichever it was. So it's there, it's successful. It has quite a lot of to and fro with traffic. I can't see it will have that many more traffic movements, as it's uh, someone said, every county doesn't see a problem with it. It just seems to me to be such a sm small bit of this application that's being turned out. So uh, I personally will uh, not be supporting the officer's recommendation. Councillor Mann. Um, yeah, I just I, this is just in the context of talking about the hierarchy of the different policies. Um, we talked about um, on a previous application about SPT one and two being the controlling policies that sort of govern overarching. And my concern about this application is that the cultural aspect of this application is what sets it apart largely from like an average application for an a. a, a uh, I think you've called it a tourism accommodation. Um, and from my perspective, that doesn't seem to have been addressed very well in the decision. So I, I, I've, I've read that you've said that it's not sustainable under SPT1 and SPT2, but I don't think that there was any discussion of the cultural aspect of, of that site. And unusually, it was more treated like just a regular business, um, which 
today's speakers have specifically been addressing that cultural aspect of this business, which is very different than a sort of, I don't know, some other type of business that you could have on that site. Um, and I guess I'm concerned, therefore, that we've started off on SPT1 and SPT2, not using the provisions there that would apply um, because, or at least I don't understand how they have been applied because there are specific ones that were raised by the two members in the in this in this that that seem to me should have been addressed and we should have looked at when we're finally balancing on Deb 15 before we get there my understanding is we should be looking at SPT 1 and 2 and in in SPT I think I'm in SPT 1 um one of the provisions is a sustainable society that it, you know has important cultural assets protected for the benefit of current and future generations and it sounds to me like this rises to the level of well i mean we've just heard about you know the monarchy being involved um that's fairly important um we've talked about the fact that there are international students coming people studying for a, a year from the other applicant those things to me should have been addressed in the decision to say why we don't think that this is an important cultural um application under SPT 1, uh, not Dev 15, because that's where that lies, unless I'm misunderstanding something. So I, I sort of feel like you know, we could have an argument just around Dev 15, which is really specifically about car travel, which is what you've kind of majored on in the decision as far as the reasons of refusal. But it seems to me that we could back up as well as a, as a committee and talk about whether or not this has a uh, uh, in the hierarchy of the planning has a has a reason under SPT one and two to actually be found sustainable before we even get to the car use. And then the car use becomes a little bit less important because we've already sort of established that we're not talking about, um, you know, a, a zoo or a public attraction that lots and lots of people are going to go to. But it's a cultural element that we really are maintaining for a very few number of car travels. and. I think it was quite convincing on the car travel aspect that you know if you're on site um, i've i've done a lot of art um group things i would much rather stay on site and not have to travel back and forth to a local community and and buy a hotel room somewhere off site because you tend to want to stay there and actually work with people so i guess i'm just saying for me what's interesting is that i don't feel that it's very well that out, at least I can't find provisions in here that address that aspect of SPT1 and SPT2 around the cultural use and business, just because it is so different from anything else I've seen. Do you, do you want to respond to that? Thank you. So with regards to SPT1, the proposal isn't for a cultural proposed use, it's for holiday accommodation. So because the sculpture school already has accommodation, we didn't go into the ins and outs of that because it wasn't proposed. The proposal is just for holiday accommodation. So that's why it wasn't gone into in a, in a you know, in depth. Um, with regards to the car use, we can, we feel and consider that there's no local facilities or services on site. If you were staying somewhere such as Winkley, where there is restaurants and pubs to go to, you're, you're there and you've got facilities around you. There's no local shop or services. There are small kitchenettes in the accommodation and obviously a bit more within the apartment, but you're still going to have to go out to, get, to reach those facilities and services. And that's where the growth in the TTB1 hierarchy is driven towards. Obviously, Winkley is not in our area, but it does provide facilities for users. Can I just clarify why um, uh, why you can't consider what the accommodation is serving on site just under SPT1? It's not part of the proposed development. The proposal is just for holiday accommodation at this site, not what the site already provides on, on site as an existing business. So the description is just holiday accommodation located within the red line boundary of an existing business not the proposal for the business. Yeah, the uh, councillor Mott. Thank you. Um, so addressing this is holiday accommodation, and I appreciate the website. And as we asked the um, speaker for the applicant, um, he confirmed that some of that was 
or outside holiday accommodation as opposed to just students. Um, therefore, I am I'm, I'm split because I can I can appreciate where you're coming from as as officers with regards to purely holiday accommodation. However, would that objection have been overcome if the accommodation was purely for student use only? <clears throat> um, uh, certainly, it would go mu uh, a long way towards um, uh, relieving that objection. I think um, the we've wrong, uh, we've as a as a borough we've won a, a number of appeals more rec quite recently on holiday accommodation in the countryside and the fact that it is very reliant on the car. Um, and so, um, in this case, I, I you know if if people are on site, they're uh, they won't have to travel to and from the site. So if they were elsewhere, they would have they would have to travel to and from as well as. Um, but there, there still will be some movement. But I would suggest that possibly it's less if it was tied to students. So if I may, sorry, Chair, because I'm still trying to get to grips with the change of order of things of how we do things now. Then, um, so I'm more than happy to propose that that is a condition that is imposed, and I'm happy to propose that we support the application and my apologies because it's not often I go against officer recommendation. Um, however, in this instance, I am minded to subject to the accommodation being tied to student accom the, um, accommodation for the students of the school as opposed to it being open holiday accommodation. Um, so my apologies, Chair, that I'm probably slightly out of order with um, the new running of, of things. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Bott. Um, I have to say, I, uh, you you got there slightly before me. Uh, I'll come to you in a in a second. Uh, um, my reading of the officer's report and the JLP is that um, of the exceptional circumstances that need to be demonstrated for development in the open countryside, the Shepherd's Hut meet none of them. I think the officer is right in saying that. On the other hand, Dev 15 asks us to support the rural economy. And um, as the officer said, it's a very finely balanced argument. This, I think we probably all agree. Uh, my own view is that, like you, were the accommodation on site tied to the students undertaking courses at the school? I would be minded to approve it. But um, I don't know if that's the general feeling of the committee or not. But um, we'll put that to the test in a minute. Uh, Councillor Guthrie. Um, I would just like to slightly go the opposite direction um, because when you're looking at what I think we saw a little bit like the Tall Valley. Um, application recently, which was a, for a sustainable farm, regenerative farming project. We again, we did go against the officer and supported it. And there was a traffic issue put forward in that um, application as well. And then on this, I think there are some similarities because I'm assuming that the um, accommodation has been put in to sustain this project economically, because I think all of us now realise that nearly every business is under more pressure than it was. So I think, although again, from the officer's point of view, to the letter of policies, you shouldn't be having those two shepherd's huts there and possibly the other one that's inside the building, but you're allowing a business to thrive, hopefully, in what is a much more complex economy for businesses everywhere. So on that level, I would say that the economic development for me tends to override the other considerations, particularly given the site that doesn't have any adverse impact on the countryside. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, yeah. Councillor? Angela. Councillor Robert first. Councillor Mann, I think you had your hand up just first, then I'll come to Councillor Jury, then Councillor Wakem. Um, I was just going to suggest that perhaps the condition could be 
um, exactly what is happening on site, which is that students are prioritized for the accommodation um, above holiday accommodation, and that is a condition so that it has to be continue. I don't know if you can actually, you know, condition it that way, but it seems to me that if that is the way it's working, that is how I see it being appropriate as a cultural support to them, but also allowing some of that economic income that you might need to have to support the school generally, which is what I am in principles in support of. Okay. Councillor Jerry. Thank you, Chair, and um, I'd like to thank the officers for their work on this. Uh, I can see why it was a finely balanced decision. I think for all of us, it's probably quite a finely balanced decision as well, and it just depends where one might put different weightings on the provisions, particularly of SPT1 and SPT2. Um, so I find myself agreeing with my colleagues. Um, I know what Ms. Housler said about um, the, judging the planning application itself. Um, but I do also feel that this is a site which I think is um, going to be increasingly important um, culturally. And I think the fact that it's based here in West Devon is quite phenomenal, actually. I mean, I've seen some of this work close up and it's it, it, it's amazing, particularly the, the Duke of Wellington statue that now resides in, in Halifax. But that aside, trying to look at this proposal, um, I can see the benefits of students being on site and being in such a beautiful location when they're concentrating on the learning that they're doing and and, and the work that they're undertaking. And uh, given that the site is already there, and I think the developments that are proposed are quite sympathetic, um, I, I'm finding myself, you know, moving a little bit towards the the, the, the balance that uh, as a as an important uh, business in the local economy, um, if we can, we should be finding a way to support. Um, so I'm very interested in the thoughts about the conditions that might be attached. That's the way from. Yeah. Um, I would just like to make the point that if um, people were staying in the, in the villages nearby, um, there would be a lot more car journeys than if they were staying on site. Yeah, that's it. And you know, this is um, a cultural gem for West Devon, and I think we should support it. Thank you, you. Councillor Moody. Thank you, Chair. Um, I understand all the, the points that have been made about um, and West Devon is now um, supporting cultural um, uh, endeavours. However, I'm minded that this application, a similar application, has been refused in the past. And that, to me, is it, it, um, it's a juxtaposition to the arguments that have been made today. You know, we're looking at material planning reasons. If it's been refused in the past, how do we um, support it today? Thank you. Planning officer, just like to respond to that. It's just to make note that the policies used to refuse the previous one are the same today. There's been no change of policies. Any other points any of the committee would wish to make? Just give me a minute. I just want. Right, having had all the uh, debate and questions, we will now put it to the vote. Um, the proposal is the retention of three holiday lets in the form of two shepherd huts, conversion of an attic space above the sculpture school, and additional photonic, pho photovoltaic panels. The officer's recommendation is for refusal. Um, who wishes to support the officer's recommendation? Chair, can I just send them as a formal proposal? The only thing we've got on the table at the moment is what Councillor Mott put forward as a proposal in terms of conditional approval. 
good condition. What the officer's recommendation? Look, look, that, hasn't put on, that hasn't been put to the meeting with the proposal and seconder. The only thing that's put to the meeting at the moment is what's been put forward. I'm happy for that to be withdrawn until after the uh, formal voting process has taken do, place. Do I have a seconder for the proposal? I'll second that. Those who wish to support the officer's recommendation, which is for refusal, please show. One in favour of the proposal to refuse. Yeah. We'll now make an alternative uh, proposal. Is, is this where I come back in, but, Mr. White? <laughs> you need to have a vote against as well. Any other voting? Okay, those against. Nine against. So that proposal is therefore lost. Thank you, Chair. Now we'll have a counter proposal from Councillor Mott. Um, in that case, Chair, I am happy to propose that we support the application subject to the accommodation being for student use. Thank you. Do I have a seconder for that? Thank you, Councillor. Can I um, just ask um, members um, if they want to have the counter proposal, can we have the reasons? Do we have to have reasons and policy reasons? I, I, I can already hear that SPT1 and SPT2 are um, the policies I, that you want. I would also like to include um, the 15. Need any more than that? Uh, just a, a reason. Uh, I mean, uh, purely in that, in that it supports an existing business within the rural economy, um, which also then supports the wider area as well. Okay, so now the proposed Councillor Mark. All right, Jack, and I just would like to say that with the proposal that Councillor Mott has made, I think it does tie the application with that condition. It brings in the cultural aspect because the accommodation is no longer just simply a tourism accommodation. Effectively, Councillor Mann is suggesting that um, the cultural matters that she was discussing earlier are addressed by limiting the accommodation to students because it's, a, it's the cultural support for that business. Yes, yes. It's like to keep you on your toes, Chairman. Um, <laughs> I would like to just be clear for everybody. Uh, now, this proposal that's being put forward is saying to definitely not allow other holiday let. Whereas when Councillor Mann spoke earlier, we were looking at a priority level. The proposal on the table <coughs> now is that <coughs> the accommodation is tied to students yeah. using the schools yeah. and is not therefore generally available for holiday lets. Thank you. That's the proposal on the table. Those in support of that proposal, please show. Seven in favour, thank you, Chair. Those against? Three against, thank you, Chair. So it's carried. The uh, proposal is that the um, holiday, the, the shepherd's huts and the um, place above the sculpture school is approved subject to the condition that it is tied to student use of the accommodation. So um, just to say in preparation for the potential for this happening, um, Hayley did um, together some conditions um, so that we don't have to defer the conditions for further um, further discussion, perhaps to the chair. Um, so Hayley will just go through the conditions she's proposing to make sure members are happy with those conditions. Thank you, Jack. So the two first conditions are standard. So you've got the time um, and then obviously the plans. We've had to apply the time condition, even though it's retrospective because of the solar panels are not yet installed. And that's why the time conditions on there. And then there's the plan conditions. Sorry, the text was just falling off the bottom. Um, the suggested holiday condition there, Councillor Mott, that you were discussing is drafted there. We can make obviously some amendments. The definition of student is not defined, so we can we can have a look at that. So this is the condition that we've drafted. We can um, add some texting about the use being in use with the sculpture school. Um, do you want me to read it out, Chairman? Or? Committee is content for 
um, myself and the vice chair and the officer to work through that condition and approve it on your behalf. We will do. Um, condition four is a holiday um, related condition. It's about keeping a log of who is staying on site so we know um, who they are, how long they've stayed for. So we have um, a note of what is going on, on site and the applicants can then provide that to us at any point in time in writing. The landscape condition is just to make sure the development isn't completed in accordance with the landscape appraisal that was um, submitted. It did include in section eight some mitigation um, regarding the shepherd's hut. So it does include removing the domestic additions when they're not in use uh, to reduce domestic paraphernalia. It also includes um, things like removing the fence and including some more natural screening. So that is where that condition is on there. We then have the solar and the EV charging points to make sure they are installed. So we've given or well, proposing three months of the date of this decision and um, going out to install those. If that's not achievable, then obviously the applicants can get back in touch and we can work through those. And then number eight is just to make sure that the surface water drainage is installed as well. Thank you. That's a if, if I may, it's probably already within the condition, um, but can I just confirm, please, that it is conditioned against the business remaining a sculpture school as opposed to should the sculpture side of the business cease for any reason that it doesn't then open itself up to become holiday accommodation. Yeah, so in the condition three, we've um, said that if the on-site business shall cease use, the development shall immediately also cease use and the removal of the shepherd's huts and all of the paraphernalia shall also be removed from site. We've also referred to um, the business as the sculpture school, so we'll see if that change that would also kick in the second part of the condition. Thank you. Well, that's the easy one out of the way. We now move on to... Um, the second application today, which is 243523 land at Beer Alston, uh, housing development, 31 new dwellings, associated access road, pedestrian links, landscaping, public open space and drainage. Just while we're waiting for the officer to uh, get ready, we have um, a number of registered speakers today. Uh, Mr. Peter Crozier, Mr. Simon Cold, Councillor Brian Lamb and Councillor Isabel Saxby. And we'll get to those when um, the time is right. We also have. Had, oh, we have Mr. Phil Townsend from Devon County Council's Highways Department because there is a highways issue within this application, which we may need to get our minds around. So when the officer's ready, I'll uh, ask her to start. Good morning, everybody. Um, OK, so this application 243523 FUL, um, it's a full application for the provision of 31 uh, dwellings, um, nine of which would be affordable, um, and it includes associated works, um, including a new access road, 
uh, pedestrian link and public open spaces. Um, I've had one, I've got one update since the report was prepared, um, and that is just an email from the agent, um, just providing some clarity um, on the work that was undertaken um, in respect to, to whether access from the, the B3257 is feasible. Um, I understand it was circulated to you, although quite uh, late on this morning, and um, I'm getting a nod, so um, you've all received it. I'll talk a bit about it. Um, within my reports. OK, so the application site is outlined red um, on the plan in front of you. Pointers here, excellent. Uh, so we've got the, the B3257 um, along the northern boundary. Um, that's the main access road um, into Beer Alston. Um, we've got the Bowling Club um, to the east here. Um, and also um, another couple of residential properties um, just down on the, the bottom corner here. Um, along the southern boundary, um, we've got Wollacombe Road um, and we've got residential development um, to the west um, down view. And this is just an aerial view um, showing the site, which is on the eastern um, edge of Beer Alston. Um, the whole site is within the Tamar Valley National Landscape. Um, and yet this is the site here. Um, you can also see this line here, which is a existing public right of way, um, which passes through the site from Downview um, into the land owned by the Bowling Club. Um, last committee, there was an application um, for a new retail store, the Co-op, um, just to the north of the site. Um, north of the B Road, um, and this is roughly in this location here. Okay. So the application site, as I've said within my report, is allocated um, both within the joint local plan and within the neighbourhood plan. Um, this plan here is just taken from the Beer Peninsula neighbourhood plan. Um, which was made, and it's the uh, development sites proposals map. Um, so there's an employment site over here, and our site is here. Um, so it's proposed um, for up to 30 dwellings. Um, there's an also, just for reference, just to the south of our site, south of Wollacombe Road, um, there's another allocation um, for 20 houses, and I don't believe we've had an application to bring forward that site yet. OK, so as you will see from the officer report, the um, application um, in front of you today, members, um, is a, an almost identical scheme which um, to one which was submitted in 2019, um, which proposes access from Wollacombe Road to the south of the site. That application was refused for the sole reason that it hadn't been demonstrated um, that access into the site from the B3257 wasn't feasible. Um, there was an appeal lodged and the appeal was also dismissed um, on this, on that uh, very reason. Um, so I just want to spend a little bit of time within the presentation um, talking about the work that has been undertaken since that appeal. I just want to start off just by reminding you, I know I've got it in the report, but just by reminding you um, of a couple of policies within the neighbourhood plan where the requirement is set out um, for the preferred um, access point to be from the, the B road. And I've just highlighted um, the policies here within H2. So the preferred site access should be directly um, onto the main road, the, the B road. However, if this does not prove feasible, an alternative access onto Wollacombe Road would be acceptable. Um, that policy also sets out a number of provisions and, and things that um, the neighbourhood plan would like to see come forward as, as part of the application, any proposal. Um, we've also got policy uh, T3, um, which talks about the Beer Alston Gateway. And within that policy, um, there is a preference for a new um, shared access um, with the site in front of us, the residential site and the bowling club. And again, it goes on to say, if this does not prove feasible, an alternative access onto Wollacombe Road um, would be acceptable. 
Um, so in terms of the previous application that went to appeal, and I've just pulled out a couple of key paragraphs, which I thought would be quite helpful um, and kind of guiding members to the things that we should be considering um, in terms of this word uh, feasible and, and whether you feel that the um, what has been done is, is sufficient to address it. Um, so paragraph 10 just talks about the definition, something of capable of being done. Uh, paragraph 11, uh, something that needs to be fully investigated. Um, and then I've just pulled out paragraph 17, um, where at the time the inspector says, I've got nothing before me which suggests that an agreement could not be reached with the neighbouring landowners, um, or that it would not be technically possible to realise the aspirations of the community in the neighbourhood plan. So, um, before the application, which is before you today, was submitted, um, there was a pre-application uh, submitted, um, which was considered between officers, the applicant, um, and the highway authority um, were also involved. And we've got Phil Townsend and Brian Hensley with us today for any questions that you may have. Um, as part of that pre-application inquiry, um, information was submitted. There was a letter um, submitted to the applicants uh, from the, the Bowling Club, um, referencing uh, the potential for a shared access. Um, and within that, the, the Bowling Club made it fairly clear um, that they didn't want to entertain um, that prospect for the time being um, because they were concerned about potential impact um, on their business. Um, so on the basis of the letter, um, officers were, were satisfied that, you know, they, they, they'd approached them um, they'd done the work that was necessary to demonstrate it wasn't feasible. This then leaves us to, to the access into the site. Um, so this is just a couple of photographs. This is taken just outside of the, the Bowling Club, um, looking uh, towards the site here. Um, and the boundary is roughly here with the Bowling Club. Um, our site here, and you can see the dwellings on down view um, in the far distance. Um, and this is just taken a uh, shot taken on the site, just looking towards um, the existing hedgerow um, that forms the, the northern boundary onto the B road. So as part of the pre-application inquiry, um, visibility displays were submitted and um, drawing shown a potential access um, onto the B road uh, were, were submitted as, as part of that prayer. Now the, there's two of two images here. Um, the bottom one, which is what I want to focus on today, um, is based on the existing speed limit, which um, I know was discussed um, on the, the co-op application, but the existing speed limit is, is 60 miles an hour. Um, and I've, I've just made this slightly bigger. And what the images demonstrate, and this has been supported by the Highway Authority, is that in order to achieve sufficient visibility displays, um, to, to meet to the satisfaction of the highway authority, there would be a requirement to use third party land. Um, part of that involves um, encroaching into one of the gardens um, on the adjoining estate for, for down view. The applicants, um, part of the pre app or, or before the pre app was submitted, um, approached the adjoining um, custodian, um, the housing association for the adjoining. Um, properties um, and they confirmed that on the basis that there would be encroachment and there would be an impact um, on a garden, they wouldn't be prepared to support uh, the, the use of their land being uh, for as, as part of a visibility display. They would also require um, third party land from the, the bowling club as well. Although contact was made with the bowling club, it was more to do with the shared access. Um, they didn't approach them on this particular matter on the basis that um, any visibility display would require um, third party land here from the adjoining residential site. And on the basis that they had said they, they weren't interested, they didn't want to share the site, um, the applicants didn't approach the, um, the bowling club. On the basis that there would be uh, third party land required and the, the support and text from Hasto, the, the adjoining residential sites. 
supported by the comments from the highway authority, officers are satisfied that the applicants have done sufficient to demonstrate that access from the B road um, wouldn't be feasible. Um, and therefore, on this basis, officers are prepared to support an access from Wallachan Road. Before I move on, um, so the other image um, on the plan in front of you um, is just an alternative showing hypothetically if the speed limit was reduced to 30. And I know there was some discussion um, on the co-op application about this. Um, even if it was reduced to 30, um, there would still be a requirement um, for third party land. Now, I just want to stress to members, obviously, we need to be determining the application and considering it based on what is in front of us today. The, uh, the speed limit for the B road is 60. Um, I know the Highway Authority have requested a, a contribution um, towards investigations to see whether the speed limit could be reduced. Um, at this stage, there is no certainty that the speed limit would be reduced. And if it is, when it would be reduced, when it would come forward and to how far out into the B road it would extend. Um, so whilst these drawings are useful in demonstrating that even if it was reduced, there would still require third party land. Um, we need to be considering that the application based on the fact that the of the current um, speed limits. So the application before you today, as with the 2019 application, proposes access um, from Wallachan Road, um, which is down here on the aerial and the, the access point is roughly where my cursor is here. Um, this image here on the top left is just stood at the corner um, between the downs um, looking towards Wollacom Road. Um, and this is just further along. Um, you can see the, the hedgerow here, um, part of which would need to be removed in order to facilitate the access. Um, this is just a couple of images from the site um, looking towards Wollacom Road and you can see the two bungalows and your access is proposed roughly here. So in terms of the 2019 application that went to appeal, um, I've just pulled up a couple of useful paragraphs which I think will be helpful. So the, the application before us today, the Highway Authority haven't objected to the, the access from Wollacom Road. Um, the inspector in considering the 2019 application was happy from a highways perspective and a safety perspective um, that the access point from Wollacombe Road um, met all the, the would be safe and, and satisfactory in terms of the impact on the, the wider highway network. Um, and that remains the same position um, today. In terms of the access point, um, there would need to be um, a removal um, of some hedgerow. Um, this has been, I, I know there was a, a concern raised by the, um, the Tamar Valley AOMB unit um, in terms of the ecological impact on this and whether sufficient work had been undertaken. Um, this has been scrutinised quite heavily by the county ecologist. Further information, further survey information was provided um, and it was clarified because I think there was some uncertainty in the documents as to whether it was 20 or 30 metres of um, hedgerow that would need to be removed. Um, this is 30 metres um, and based on the additional survey work that has been undertaken, the ecologist um, is no longer raising any issues with the removal of this section of hedgerow, um, although in terms of impact in bats and foraging, um, there are fairly strict lighting conditions that have been proposed um, and all of the, the um, recommendations made by the ecologist have followed through into the recommended conditions. Um, so on that basis, officers are comfortable with what is proposed. So just to conclude this section, um, officers are satisfied work to demonstrate to our satisfaction that an access point from the, the B3257 isn't feasible. Um, and this is on the basis that the visibility displays would require um, third party land. Um, we're satisfied that they've they've done sufficient work to demonstrate that there's no certainty this could come forward. Um, and on the basis of the letter that was provided from the Boland Club, um, officers are also satisfied that they've they've demonstrated that a, a shared access point um, isn't feasible either. 
So I just want to quickly turn on to some other matters. So if I can just rattle through a couple of site photographs. Uh, so this was just taken on the site looking towards the Bowling Club. Um, we've got the B Road here um, and the existing public right of way, which uh, there's a gate here and you can just see it here. Um, this is just beyond the Bowling Club uh, boundary, uh, looking towards the properties on down view. Um, and again, you can just see the um, footpath. Um, this is down in the, the bottom corner, close to Wollacombe Road, looking northwards. And again, you can see the, um, some of the properties on down view. Um, and then again, also standing close to the, the Bowling Club boundary, looking at the properties of Downview um, and towards Wollacombe Road, um, and also another shot just looking towards um, Wollacombe Road um, and roughly where the new access is proposed. OK, so in terms of the proposal in front of us, as I've said, it is very um, similar uh, to, to what was proposed in 2019. Um, we've got 31 units, nine of which would be affordable, and that is plot 13 and uh, plots 24 to um, 31. Um, access here, we've got dwellings throughout the site. We've also got um, open space areas that are proposed, um, and that's been reviewed by the, um, the council's open space specialist. Um, They've requested conditions and 106 requirements in terms of the management of that space and what will be proposed on it. Um, in terms of the, the design, um, again, it's, it's fairly similar to, to what was put forward in, in 2009. Of house types that are proposed, slate roofs, um, a mix of, of slate hanging and render to the walls. Um, and I've just got a couple of section drawings that have been submitted, just just giving you an idea of, of what this um, scheme would like look like when it's developed. Um, so the bottom image here is taken from the, the B road um, and what you would see when you're driving along that, the, the rear of the properties to the top here. Um, and the image above section seven is just taken from um, Wollacombe Road and what you would see um, when you're looking. Uh, driving along here or walking along here and there's just a couple of um, images from how it would look within the site um, and similarly a couple of other shots just um, showing what it uh, would look like uh, throughout the site. Uh, so in terms of the house and mix we've got 22 open markets um, and the mix is broken down here um, and nine uh, affordable units which doesn't quite make the 30 percent contribution um, on-site uh, provision that the policy requires, but their full would be met with a financial contribution that would be secured through the, the 106. Um, uh, you will see from the report that there was a bit of discussion between the landscape officer um, and the Tamar Valley um, A1B unit. Um, since the application was originally submitted, there's been um, additional landscape and that's been added. Um, this northeastern corner um, that has been strengthened um, and there's been additional plants and that is um, also followed through um, throughout the site as well. Um, based on the comments that we've had, um, the, the objections that were originally proposed um, have been removed. Um, and this uh, image here is just to show that the public right of way um, that runs through the existing site would be retained, albeit slightly rerouted. Um, the rights of way officer at the Devon County Council has reviewed it and they haven't raised any objections, um, although they have made a couple of comments which would be included um, on informatives. Um, since the 2019 application was considered, the Council's Climate Emergency Planning Statement um, has been adopted. Um, and in order to address um, the requirements within the, uh, the statement, um, it's confirmed that all, so that all properties will follow a fabric first approach. But in addition, all properties will have roof mounted PV panels. Um, and this drawing here just Quite hard to see, which shows the position um, of the panels, which will be um, uh, installed on all properties. All properties would also have an air source heat pump and electric uh, charging points. 
uh, which goes beyond the measures that were proposed previously. Um, OK, so just wrapping up in terms of the key issues, it's an allocated site. Um, obviously, there's lots of discussions um, on the, the proposed access for the reasons set out. Officers are satisfied um, that sufficient work has been undertaken to demonstrate that um, an access point from the, uh, the B road isn't feasible. Um, impact on the national landscape and housing mix. This is just a, a quote um, from the appeal decision um, that the Whilst the, um, the appeal focused on the, the feasibility question, um, there was kind of reference made to some other elements um, and there was clear support for the, the housing mix and the, um, what was proposed in terms of landscaping. And I would say this scheme goes further um, than what was proposed in terms of landscaping. Um, we've got a 106, um, which will ensure that a number of the, the, the benefits proposed will come forward. The affordable housing to remain in perpetuity, um, as a, a contribution that the Highway Authority have requested, similar to what was on the application, um, for a contribution to, to see whether there is scope to reduce the, the speed limit um, along the Bay Road. Um, we've got almost 45,000 contributions towards off-site play in sports contribution, which is good for the local community, um, and contributions towards secondary school transport, um, maintenance of public open space, etc. Um, and in terms of other technical matters that have been raised, um, officers are satisfied that through appropriate conditions, um, all of these uh, can be resolved. So on that basis, the officer recommendation is for conditional approval, subject to the Section 106 reinforcement. Thank you very much. A very comprehensive report. Um, I'll come to uh, questions that the committee might have for you in, in a sec. I've just got two. Um, one you'll be relieved to know isn't about the road, <laughs> but one is. Um, I'll start with the road one, just to sort of clear out of the way. My understanding is that the current speed limit along the B road is 60. And um, in order to get the splays, um, uh, extra land would have to be acquired from either the bowling or well, both the bowling club at one end. and yep. um, But were the speed limit 30, would that extra land be required to be uh, um, required to be yeah. acquired, or or does it take that bit of it out of the equation? Um, I don't know. If I, oh, I can't make this. Does again. that make sense? Um, yes, it does. So, as part of the work that was undertaken for the free app, um, the applicants did provide a drawing um, showing what the visibility displays would be if the speed limit hypothetically was reduced to thirty. And this does confirm that, yep, there would still be a requirement for third party land. Um, no. Obviously, that hasn't been investigated um, significantly on the basis that the, the current conditions are, are 60. Yeah, but were they 30, then uh, extra there would land still be a requirement for additional land, yes. The other question I've got is not about uh, the road at all. Um, there were a couple of um, comments in your report, um, almost sort of regrets, if I could put it that way. Um, it was regrettable that the number of affordable homes wasn't quite 30%. Okay. It was regrettable that the gardens weren't quite the size that they should have been to comply with um, national standards. And it was regrettable that the public open space wasn't as big as it should be. Okay. Um, those three comments sort of put together rather suggest that the number of houses on this site is slightly more than there should be. Everything's been sort of crammed in a bit. And my question really is, um, have any of those things changed since the last application? No, or they haven't. Were, were we prepared to accept those regrets the last time we saw this? Yeah, I mean, quite a significant amount of work was undertaken to resolve a lot of the uh, concerns during the previous application. The scheme in front of us, there has been some minor changes regarding drainage, for example, but the scheme in front of us today is pretty much identical to that was proposed previously. Um, obviously, you'll be aware policies often pull in different directions. And I think when we're summing up, it's kind of within that plan and balance is, you know, what we've got in front of us acceptable. I mean, I just pulled that quote in at the end from the appeal statement because clearly in, the inspector felt that the um, the impact on the landscape and the, the housing mix was acceptable. Yeah, I mean, within the, the you know, you're never going to get a perfect scheme. 
but I, um, we are we, officers are satisfied in terms of what we've got. Um, it does go a long way to meeting a lot of our policies, and within the plan and balance, it is acceptable. Other questions from members of the committee, please. Councillor Moody and then Councillor Mott. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and just a technical issue uh, on the plan that you gave us, the red outline um, on the left hand side uh, went into the back gardens and across the house uh, at the bottom. Um, can I can I presume that um, that is incorrect and that in on the submitted plans, they are along the boundary? Uh, yes, that is correct. I think it's just how the lines are drawn and the thickness of the line for um, the damage. But yes, I, I can confirm. Sure that yeah, we, there is we, no encroachment. That we weren't stepping on any legal oh. toes. Oh, that's the bot. Thank you. Can I just get clarity, please, on the proposed condition eight, where you talk about a biodiversity net plan to be provided, and that the net gain is going to be provided off-site. But your detailed condition talks about a management plan and mentions no word about the net gain or where it's going to be provided. Can I just get clarity on that, please? Yeah, I did write that because obviously there is, um, in terms of biodiversity net gain, there's been quite a lot of change recently and we're still getting our heads around what we can and con condition and what shouldn't shouldn't be on the decision notice and uh, section 106 agreements um but yeah so um obviously the the 10 percent policy requirement and now mandatory requirement wouldn't quite be met on site and that has been acknowledged by the county ecologist um in terms of the finer details and where things are going um that is kind of why that condition is there um, so we can secure that at condition stage. Um, there is also a requirement within the 106 because they don't quite meet that 10% and they're going to need to provide off-site mitigation that we look at that through the 106 and whether they need to go to a habitat bank or not to provide it the off-site. Um, but yeah, I have run that past the ecologist and he was comfortable. Councillor Mann, I'll come to you in a second. But just uh, Mrs Houseland wants to say something. So just so that members uh, are aware, um, the um, new regulations for BNG have come in on the 2nd of April. Um, um, thankfully, we already had 10% in our JLP policy, so we've been using that um, up until now. Um, but there's a slightly slight change in that um, any off-site um, mitigation has to be um, done in a registered habitat bank. And at the moment, we don't have any registered in West Devon or South Hams. Clearly, um, we have two which are going through the process, one in West Devon and one in South Hams. So it is hoped that as if if members are, approve the application, that registration process process will have happened and we will be able to secure a local um, BNG uh, contribution. Um, but at the moment, we don't. We don't have that. So again, the condition will hopefully allow for that process to happen, which is is ongoing as we speak, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, so otherwise, it might have to go. I think there's one in Exeter. Um, but 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 that this is like an evolving process, which will continue um, over the next few months, years, and and more habitat banks will become available. But just wanted to clarify that for members. Councillor Mann. Um, I also had a question around the um, conditions that were to do with the biodiversity um, monitoring plan. It says monitoring reports will be submitted to the council during years 2, 5, 7, 10, 20 and 30 from commencement of the development. I'm just wondering who that is going to carry that condition because I can't imagine a developer coming back 30 years later and giving us a biodiversity monitoring plan update. So I'm just wondering how that's envisioned to happen. So again, um, this is part of the evolving uh, regulations for BNG. The idea is that a habitat bank will ch will make a charge for habitat, what they call habitat credits, and the credits will be um, quite expensive because they will include the monitoring uh, aspect. So the habitat bank owner will be the person that will um, 
that will do that monitoring and send those monitoring reports to the local planning authority and that's part of the agreement they would have with the developer um, uh, and that's a that's a, a agreement between the developer and the habitat bank not included within the planning um, process but the condition will ensure that that actually happens so if it doesn't happen we are we are able to serve a breach of condition notice come back on that yeah, just clarity then. So the biodiversity monitoring plan has nothing to do with this actual site or location. It will be completely off site. As I understand it, some of it will be on site and some of it will be off site. So again, then my question goes to it can't be that a land bank someplace in Exeter is going to come out and monitor biodiversity on this housing estate. How is that going to happen if that is what we're saying will be in the plan or is that totally separate? So there are two elements here. So there will be some biodiversity net gain that is provided on site. Um, the recent uh, government changes that have been made require that land and the, the biodiversity net gain to be in place for 30 years, um, which is why we require these monitoring reports at intervals. And this is, you know, um, the policy that we've got within the joint local plan just is applicable to majors in terms of the 10%, but it is now being rolled out to all minors, um, although there are a number of exceptions. Um, and this 30 year requirement um, is applicable to, to all these developments which are not exempt. There is going to be a significant amount of work that it does generate. Um, but yeah, there is kind of a national requirement now to provide these monitoring reports. So this can the condition is kind of relating to the stuff that's on site. Um, the and as Jack said, it is kind of a uh, evolving process um, in terms of how we deal with the the habitat banks um, and the owners of those. They will also be required to submit monitoring reports for that element as well. Appreciate it's complicated. We're still getting our heads around it. And just to follow on from that, do we have anybody with e ecology experience on staff within our team at West Devon to understand those reports? No, we don't, but we pay uh, Devon County Council's ecologists to provide us with ecology advice. That's Lamont. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I opened this particular can there, and I'm trying not to let it be the main focus of the of, of the conversation for this. However, um, you did mention, of course, the cost involved with that. Is that something that's likely to be passed on to residents as part of the management plan of the site and the maintenance of the site? No, the developer has to pay the pay it. Thank you. Any further questions for the planning office before we have our registered speakers? Oh, OK. Um, our first speaker is Mr. Peter Crozier. Next councillor, he knows the ropes and he knows he only has three minutes. The clock will be upon him. Uh, could you, can you sit down and talk to the microphone so that everyone can hear you? First of all, I'd like to say there was an email you mentioned at the beginning, which we haven't seen. We have a copy distributed before we've all spoken. Thank you. Yeah, no, that was just circulated to the, the members on committee. So yeah, well, yeah. we have a member here and she hasn't seen it either. Well, may I say, I, I have written two letters to the planning officer in the last two months, and neither of those have been commented on or actually put on the website. Just please note. Um, right. um, I do. Are you ready to give us your three minutes worth? I, I'm going to just point to this plan, if I may. The, one of the main objectives. Uh, Councillor Cro uh, Crozier, you have three minutes. So your three minutes started. I'm going to leave that if you're not going to, if you're not going to give me the chance. The chance, the, the the reason that plan is up there is the fact that there are four corners on that boundary. Three of them are very difficult, as you can see, 
their ability of reflex pens. And each one of them would not be built today under the housing traffic regulations we have today, because each one has an impediment for people using it in a car. Full stop. This, uh, I'm also having to include um, a couple of comments from other objectors who wanted to speak to this committee that they can't because this committee will only let one person speak. I'm speaking as an independent person. The application has 25 objections from members of the public. 90% are against the Woolacombe Road. Others mention architecture being bland and issues of are they truly affordable? Drains, are, drains and effluent are also mentioned. You can ask a question on that later. The main objective of the Paris Council have worked incredibly hard to make it more possible to get an exit uh, from this project onto the B3257. Co-op convenience, or should I say convenience store, has a, an undertaking from highways to extend the 30 mile an hour limit further out the village. Fortunately, highways have not given a plan or a timescale for this to happen. This is regretful, but an undertaking has been made. Highways has recently informed me that Burrington's will have to have control of 43 metres each side of their entrance to comply with their rules. However, the co-op application does not actually have this, nor does the bowling club. In fact, the bowling club, which was granted under a 60 mile an hour speed limit, their splay, as you've seen from the photographs, intercepts the Burrington boundary by 34 metres. Neighbourhood plan constructed with foresight, which the planning officers have disregarded, not only just looking at this application in front of them. If they studied, studied the complete neighbourhood plan, they would see there was another potential development site on the opposite side of Woolacombe Road, which would not bring, uh, which would bring more traffic onto this road. The implicit wish was to limit the amount of traffic that was to use this road in the future in the neighbourhood plan. Furthermore, I've had a retired senior planner with knowledge of the neighbourhood plan who was seriously unhappy with the stance taken here by the fans and considered it the least desirable. Other potential developments, the other potential development site on the Woolacombe Road should have merited a material consideration as it will impose further traffic onto an already unsatisfactory road network when built. Ergo, this is the worst option. There has been interest on the other side on Willowcombe Road. Therefore, I urge you all to reject this application and think again. Thank you. If I have time, you can see the photographs. Four minutes over, four seconds over. Well done. Uh, questions from the committee to Peter Crozier. That picture there, you can see the overlie of the hedgerow going down the Burrington. Questions? I had, I had a similar uh, one. Uh, Councillor Mann. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious about the other site that you mentioned, the site along Willowcombe Road. I mean, that would also bring traffic, as you said. Yeah, yes, it, and the only exit from that site is Willowcombe Road. It's potentially for 20 houses. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, next registered speaker is Simon Coles from Burrington Estates. Morning, same for you, I'm afraid. Three minutes from uh, when you press the button and get going. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, members. Um, you've heard the sites allocated for developments uh, in your local plan and also the parish council's neighbourhood plan. The officers have said the application accords with the provisions um, of both of those plans and it's recommended for conditional approval subject to a 106. You've heard about the nine affordable homes. Um, the requirement is 9.3 and it's normal practice to round down and provide an off-site contribution for the balance. So that's where that has come from, Chair. You've heard about the solar PV, the air source heat pumps. We think it's a really well-designed scheme with a play area, 
homes set in spacious gardens and plenty of landscaping. Thanks to the neighbourhood plan, you've heard in detail about the requirements that have been placed upon us. Um, we, we are clear and it's not in dispute that there is no potential for a shared access with the bowling club. They have said it's not feasible, it won't happen. We have done assessments of the existing 60 and also the 30 MPH zones. The 30 MPH, I'm sorry to say, and I, and I sympathise greatly with the Parish Council to a point, but the 30 MPH extension is pure speculation at the moment. There is nothing before you that says it could happen, when it's going to happen, um, and where it could be extended to. And your officers deal with that in the report in, in, in quite a lot of detail. Actually, there are design benefits uh, for a southern access, uh, and it's to do with the uh, uh, location or the position of the public footpath, play area and the green space on the other side. And that, that is in a green and very low trafficked part of the site. Those benefits wouldn't arise if there was an access from the north because the majority of site traffic would come past the play area, cross the public footpath, and go down further into the site to the other homes there. The, the parish councils say that a 30 MPH uh, might make a difference to the assessment, and, and you've just heard that they've made a claim that says that the highway authority have given an undertaking for uh, a 30 MPH extension. That is not the case. There is no undertaking anywhere um, that suggests that might happen. In fact, your officer's reports say that the 30 MPH extension speed limit would fail to satisfy national and local requirements. And I quote, at this stage, there is no certainty when a review of the speed limit would occur or guarantee it will be supported and if it is supported, there is no certainty when the revised speed limit would be introduced. As I say, it's pure speculation. This application ticks all the boxes, and we ask respectfully that it is approved today in line with the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much, and well done keeping to time. Uh, questions, please, for Mr Coles from the committee. Nope. Got off short break. Very much. Oh, sorry, sorry, you haven't. Just, just <laughs> a quick one. I didn't want to let you get away with it. Um, the, is there a cost benefit to the developer for using that southern access point? No, uh, I, I, I think it's uh, I think it's a design uh, benefit. Um, to be honest, um, I, I, I think that where you have houses that would face the main road, um, that would be less desirable in, in design terms for the people living there and, and, and traffic coming in off the main road. I think it's I, I think it makes sense in, in design terms for the southern access. And of course, um, councillor, the neighbourhood plan provides for a southern access. Um, if if the parish council who drafted their neighbourhood plan only wanted an access from the north, well the neighbourhood plan should have said so or would have said so, but it but it doesn't. It, it actually allows for and provides for um, southern access. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, right, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Our next registered speaker is Councillor Brian Lamb from Beer Ferris Parish Council. Again, no stranger to this committee. You have some slides. Okay, when you're ready. Yeah, make a start. Good morning, everybody. First of all, to clear an item that the last speaker 
about the neighborhood plan. The word feasible visibility put, was put in by the examining officer of the neighborhood plan as a, an amendment. Um, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, that I think you've been misled and planning officers have been misled about the bowling club access. Sorry, the other, the other map, I wanted both on, please. Now, the one showing the site. Aslam, if you sit down and get close to the microphone, everyone will be able to hear what you say. But if you stand yeah, up, they I won't. I need to point at the map first. <laughs> that wouldn't Not it. it. The access that you've all been talking about is an access through the bowling club here and onto the road there. Where's back to the visibility displays? The visibility space is a different mass altogether, and the bowling club have not been approached about control, not ownership of that area of their land uh, as a part of the visibility display. And Hasto Homes have also said in their statement, we would not be minded to transfer the land unless it did not impact on residents' garden. Should a different boundary feature be acceptable to the planners, which would allow we may be able to reconsider our position. I leave with this with you to wish to investigate further. That was to Hasto Homes, and we obtained that letter by an FOI uh, request to this council. So there you have Hasto and the Bowling Club both willing to talk to the developers. Now, the inspector said in his arguments here, that you've got to demonstrate the feasibility. I would suggest, Chair and Councillors, they have not demonstrated any feasibility uh, studies. And up to yesterday, Burlington Homes had not had approached either organisation on the, those lines to see if they could get control of that land. And in, View of this, we believe that the northern entrance is viable, and I ask you to consider that in your deliberations. The only other thing is the Bat Highway. We have four ecologists from the county, from the district, from the parish, and from the TVNL who have all cautioned about the Bat Highway there and have asked for serious conditions to be put on this application if you should approve it today. Plans are being made, as you know, for a 30 mile speed limit on the B3257, and that will affect this application and also the, the length and size of the splays. And I understand there is a development condition going into for the developers to uh, finance that. Release. And finally, in your report, you talk about some artwork on the side of the road. I don't think the 57 people in my parish who are looking for affordable homes will really appreciate artwork on the side of a road rather than at the village gateway at Corrie Corner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, questions for Councillor Lamb, please. Councillor Moody. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lamb. Um, just wanted to ask the question with the um, neighbourhood plan, the previous speaker said that the preference was for a southern uh, entry to the development. No, the can preference you, in the you, neighborhood. Can you explain that um, difference? Of, uh, no, the pre neighborhood plan states the preference for the northern entrance unless it was not feasible. Other questions for Councillor Lamb? I've just got one. Um, you've managed to confuse me a bit, I think. Welcome you unconfusing me. Um, about the bowling club access, suggesting that the one that we think we're talking about isn't the one that you're talking about. Yes. Just be a bit more explicit about that. The one you were talking about, which was the original one in the neighbourhood plan, but 
It had to be pulled back because the highway said a mini roundabout was not possible on the main road. And the plan was the entrance of the site would be through this boundary hedge here and would go down and join the bowling club entrance there with a mini roundabout there. And that was the highway said no. That and we went on to the north end. Highways officers then, with the applicant, developed the visibility strays on it, would allow a northern entrance to be operated. That's a meeting. Based on that, are you saying that the bowling club is happy to discuss with? The, the, the shared access to... Um, this is a letter from the bowling club. And... Where? We have the letter from Hasto. And so as not to wrong foot the officers and the committee, both of these letters were sent to the chief planning officer on the 24th, 22nd of March this year. Um, and the bowling clubs say, we have not been approached. They talk about their initial refusal of going to do half, taking off half their car park and site, which was just not acceptable to them. Particularly the approach that was made by Hasto Estates, the approach was they found three men on their uh, land with plans no sort of courtesy of we coming, can we talk, or anything like that at all. So that was turned down. But in the same letter, they say, we have not been approached since by Burrington Estates with regard to any effect the new plans of development would have on our land. So we cannot comment in any way. As we have previously stated, we do support the 30 mile an hour speed limit being extended down to Quarry Corner. That's the letter from uh, Hester. Thank you. But supplementary is, is could I have a response from the officer uh, regarding the feasibility uh, um, decision based on that further information? So, um, the approach, as, as far as I understand it, um, was made to the bowling club in relation to a shared access, which um, is referred to in the um, neighbourhood plan. They declined that. No approach was made by the applicant or it was regard to the visibility displays because they had already received a negative response from Hasto about the Western um, part of that visibility display. So they did, so the applicant didn't approach um, the bowling club with regard to that because they'd already had a no from the other side. Um, just based on that Hasto email that we've just seen, can you just explain to me with the visibility display, does there need to be a transfer of land or could that be done by condition regarding? What they've suggested in Hasto about what the boundary treatment was or or whatever so that you could see what is control well there needs to be agreement from a third party landowner otherwise there can be no certainty that the development would be delivered and if we haven't got that certainty whilst there is nothing to stop somebody applying for planning permission you know I, I could apply to, to to build a house in your garden um, there's lots of legal reasons as to why I could never build that house. And similarly here, um, you know, if they were to submit an application, they could serve notice. But if you've got Hasto saying we're not going to give you the land or you, you can't use that in order to provide a visibility display, little point in doing with that application if it's not going to be delivered. I think, Sorry, Mr. Can you Chairman, put the, the word is can control. You, can you put the letter back up just so I can read yeah, the writing? and? And and just and just explain to me how you interpreted the the the, the response by Asto.
would just add, I think, because of the location of the neighbouring garden, and I've had this discussion with the um, with the the applicant or the the agent, and it's difficult to see how any visibility display could come forward that doesn't impinge on that garden because of its position right up against the road. Any further questions for Councillor Lamb? Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is Councillor Isabel Saxby, Ward Member. Again, no stranger to the committee, you have of the ward member five minutes. I, yeah, I didn't think I'd be back so soon. <laughs> Off you go. Okay, great. So I just want to say thanks as well again to the well, the step for application, but you know it's not easy what you do making these decisions that affect real people's lives. It's not easy and you have to weigh it up carefully. So I want to say thank you, Rick, for pointing out that they haven't hit the 30% mark of affordable homes. The gardens Did you get closer to the machine. Thank you. The gardens aren't large the gardens aren't large enough. The public space isn't good enough. And I was just informed by somebody who was previously on this application, nothing's changed. This is the same proposal they're putting forward apart from a few minor tweaks. Um, the people of West Devon deserve better. The people in my ward deserve a better quality of living in the homes, especially affordable homes. Um, and you know, I get what the previous speaker, Mr. Coles, I think his name was, said, but you could always just put a footpath leading from one exit to the park. Put a footpath through the through the homes and that would make it so much more accessible for the people there. So the first thing I'll start on is there are blind corners at either side. There, through some work we did, we, dis we discovered there was probably an accident every other year that happened there. Non-fatal, however, one person had a spinal injury from an accident on those blind corners and he's now paralyzed. He lives on down view. If we put 60 more cars on that road, there will be more accidents, more pedestrians crossing, and it creates a real issue for the pedestrians when there's a 45 degree of visibility as they leave the south exit coming to the park. That can be, someone's paralyzed from those accidents there. The second point is, this is where's the collaboration been? Burrington Homes could have approached us, the parish. We could have worked closely on this application to the benefit of the local people. I mean, the co-op's really gone out of their way to make massive adjustments on really minor things we've nitpicked at. Where is that collaboration? Because if we could have mentioned all these things, spoken to the bowling club and really discussed it with people, but they, they didn't talk to Hasto Homes. They didn't approach the bowling club in the right manner. And so they've used that to go, no, we can't have a north facing entrance. And I think collaboration would go really far. We, I want to say that we want the homes. We recognize there's a need for the homes, but we want it done properly and in a way that benefits everyone in our community, including being on a TVNL, a national landscape that's really important for local economies. The third point, which isn't as important as the other two, but I'm just thinking about the ramifications on the neighbourhood development plan. If they can just walk over a neighbourhood development plan and someone, well, I didn't know this as well before my time, but apparently feasible exit was added in. If they can go, oh, based on these things, it's not doable. What does our neighbourhood development plan stand for? And how does this affect other neighbourhood development plans? And the fourth point is, the local plan currently allows for another 20 homes to be built on the opposite side of Wollacombe Road, which means even more traffic at two blind corners, even more at these junctions. Why use a junction that was built for a horse and cart when a new junction could be constructed for modern day traffic? Every family has two cars now. So I want to finish this by saying I don't want a repeat of the tours. I still received emails over that and it was before my time. You know, we want affordable homes, good gardens, a public space that works for the people here. And we're happy to collaborate as long as there's a sensible housing arrangement with no dangerous exits. And that's what I have to say on this application. Make your own decision. But that's those are my thoughts on it. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, questions for Councillor Saxby. The committee. Yep. Thank you very much. I have a, a, a point for the senior planner wishes to make. Um, 
first of all, I just wanted to um, ask you to disregard any reference to the co-op in relation to the other uh, application. Cell development, I think I explained this um, pre previously at our last meeting, so I uh, just wanted to say it's a retail development. Um, and secondly, um, I think the issue that we have here um, is very much related to the wording of the neighbourhood plan policy um, in that whilst the preference was identified as being the road, the, the other road, Willicombe Road, was also identified as a possibility on the basis that if, if it wasn't feasible, and that's obviously the issue that um, Lamb has raised in relation to has it been proven feasible or not feasible. But I also think that the neighbourhood plan policy and re reference to um, Golden Club uh, uh, and their agreement, if you like, to um, a shared access or not, puts a, a big pressure on a developer um, and also an un, almost an, un, an unfair pressure because it, it, the, the, the Bowling Club have a great deal of power in, in, in if they know, which is what they've done in this case. Um, but equally, um, any land in third party ownership uh, becomes um, a, could potentially become a ransom strip. So if you've got a piece of land that you know a development is, development is going to rely on, essentially say, yeah, you can have it, but I'll have a million pounds or actually in this case, it's much smaller bits of land. So to the, to the neighbourhood plan policy in some ways has sort of ended up creating this problem that we have. If the neighbourhood plan policy had said, we, uh, we want the access on the B road, end of, it would have been much more straightforward. The developer could have come along, made the access, had to have negotiations with the two third parties, which may or may not have been successful. Um, but we're now in a situation where we've got, a, have got an either or situation and, and actually the developer um, has worked since 2019, if you like, to try to overcome the issues. Um, planning officer is like, satisfied that he has, they have demonstrated that it's not feasible. Um, and that's why that she's made the recommendation she has. Um, I won't say any more. Thank you. Uh, just before I come to question, other questions from the committee, um, one of the questions that occurs to me, um, and it might occur to you too, is um, the relevant relative safety of the two solutions, if I could put it that way. We do have Mr Townsend here, who is the sort of expert on matters of highway safety. Um, so I'd appreciate if he could just address uh, the question of whether he has any concerns about either of the options in front of us are, are both acceptable in terms of highway safety, as I suppose the question. Good morning, members. As far as I was aware, there was only one option in front of us, and that's the application that we're considering today. Am I wrong? I missed that. As far as I was aware, there is only one option in front of us, and that is as submitted on the application today. Are you asking me to comment on something that isn't a planning application, Chairman? Well, I wondered if you had an opinion on the merits of the safety of either of the two options. I, I'm afraid as a highways officer, I'm not into doing beauty contests. I'm I'm, I will comment on the application as submitted, and as I, I have done so, and my comments on this application were the same as before, and they were shared by the inspector at the previous appeal, and that was reproduced by the planning officer very completely um, in her most excellent report. Um, I think it's paragraph 24 from memory from the appeal decision, where it says quite clearly that there are no issues with respect to the application currently at appeal. Um, sorry, with the application currently in front of us. The with respect to the other access, that has been dealt with perfectly clearly by council, uh, by um, Ms. Hall in her presentation, and it says that it requires um, third party land to provide the visibility, so the appropriate visibility couldn't be provided. Thank you very much. Uh, right, um, we're in debate. So, yeah. Councillor Mott. I will try and keep it to debate, Chair, but I might sneak a little question in there. You're perfectly if, entitled to. If I may. 
I have to say I am really disappointed that we could not come up with a scheme that joins in with the existing road from the neighbouring development as there is clearly an intent and a possibility to do so looking at the way that the road approaches. So I, I have to say I'm, I appreciate we cannot um, be dependent on applications and we have to look at what is within the red line. But I am very disappointed that we did not think to tie up the two developments and use an existing access off of Willacombe Road and tie the development into that, which would make much more sense to me. Um, I'm, I'm not satisfied that enough work has gone on into the, um, the road as it is. I'm still torn over which way I'm going to go. Um, but I just wanted to make the point that I am disappointed at the lack of um, joined up thinking, shall we say. Um, I, I agree with you, Councillor Mott. Um, when the application was originally um, with before um, us, that was something which was raised with the developer in what were, what were a year long, year or more long um, series of negotiations because that felt like it would be appropriate um, from our perspective as well. But the developer was not prepared to change their scheme on that basis. There is a pedestrian route, um, but not a vehicular route. Other points of discussion? That's a jury. Thank you, Chair. And um, again, thank you for a really thorough report and a really excellent, I think, explanation. Um, yes, we're all Again, the reasons these come before us are because they're difficult and we're all wrestling with the uh, the balance. Um, it, it seems to me that um, there's a lot of things colliding here, as there always are with these type of, uh, of applications, um, including the NPPF, our joint local plan, where the site is allocated, the neighbourhood plan where the site is allocated, the previous refusal and the uh, the ruling that came down from the uh, the inspector. Um, it also seems to me that the officers have satisfied themselves that the the work that's been done in looking at the northern access as being feasible has been carried out. And uh, I know there are there are some other things that are perhaps disappointing from our view as members, such as the size of the gardens, so on. But that again is dealt with in the report. Um, there's lots of issues here with it being part of a national landscape and the benefits that we get from this site from having the shared areas and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I think it's a really tricky one to try and weigh up, but I uh, I, I think my mind is, is, is made up and I find it difficult to see uh, any way forward other than supporting the, uh, the recommendation. Any other comments? Okay, we'll take it to the vote. Uh, the proposal is uh, for 31 new dwellings, associated access road, pedestrian link, landscaping, public open space and drainage at uh, Ralston. Uh, the officer's recommendation is to support with conditions. Under section, under section 106. Under section 106, indeed. Um, those in favour of the officer's recommendation, be sure. Oh, sorry, we need to second that. Uh, second it? Yes, I suppose. Yeah. Yes, reluctantly, I'm supposed to. I will second it, yes. Okay. Right. Those in favour of the recommendation, please show. Those against? <laughs> There's eight for, two against, and therefore the recommendation is carried. Thank you, Chair. Now move on through the agenda. Sorry, I'm doing the best with my ears this morning. Our planning appeals update. Just loading that up onto the machine.
Thank you, members. This is just um, a quick um, update on the appeals that we've had in um, in terms of decisions recently. Um, the first one um, is for the old railway cottage at Patricot. The proposal was for construction of log cabin for dog grooming purposes. The application was refused um, at the council level and the inspector also dismissed the appeal. Um, this is a little red dot here, if you can see it. Just there is the location uh, on a Google map um, showing where it is in relation to Patricot. Um, and if you look at the location plan further down, it's the um, blue little uh, building outlined in blue. Uh, the applicant wanted to run a dog grooming business from the site. Um, the application was refused because it was not um, uh, essential for it to be in this rural area. I'm coming back again to the uh, whole SPT 1 and 2 and um, Dev 15 dis uh, discussion. Um, the inspector uh, agreed that the site was, was was too far away from any main town which had any um, facilities, uh, as we always talk about with sustainable development. Also down a road which probably wouldn't be um, appropriate for walking, cycling um, and um, not very a likely option um, and uh, he made reference to the joint local plan and, and talked about the uh, towns and villages um, and economic development only permitted where it would support the principles of sustainable development uh, so he talked about the policies that we've been talking about um, and um, it was quite a long a long appeal decision um, on maybe only one issue but um, he talked about Dev 15 um, and it was interestingly talked about um, the first paragraph of Dev 15 talks about uh, development um, should be support rural de you know, development for rural in rural areas should be supported in, in he, he quoted suitable locations and I think that's one of the areas where Dev 15 um, is um, we certainly advised by our policy colleagues is, is quite important so Yes, it supports rural uh, development in rural areas, and I, and I appreciate totally that uh, in West Devon we are going to be constantly getting applications in such areas, um, and the whole sustainable argument is going to be something which we will we will we'll have to battle with as we move forward. But um, maybe the word suitable locations, we maybe need to do a bit of work around what that means actually in reality. Um, Did send a quick note round to a few. I think we're going to have to do some work on here, otherwise we'll tangle ourselves up on um, uh, development in the countryside and sustaining the rural economy time after time after time. And uh, I have had in my mind some sort of algorithm that we might construct because um, uh, Having, I mean, like the the, um, the caravans, the shepherd's huts that we talked about uh, earlier today, having accommodation which is linked to a business which is already there is quite different from having two shepherd's huts suddenly appearing in the middle of absolutely nowhere. They're still shepherd's huts, but there's a connection we had. And I, I don't think we've really got our collective minds around how we differentiate clearly between the two and I think that would be a conversation well worth having. Um, I have been approached by other members in, in relation to this, this very issue so yeah. Uh, the next appeal decision was a householder application at Chapel Orchard, Sanford Courtney, it's an application for extensions and alterations to the existing dwelling. It was refused and again dismissed the appeal. This was the proposal, so the original building Original building um, is this bit here, and um, proposed extension. So it's rather large. The application was refused because it was felt that it was a dominant and poorly related um, extension in relation to the traditional dwelling because it was a traditional um, cottage and inappropriate scale. And the inspectors um, 
felt that it had not been so initially someone one of the reasons refusal talked about whether or not the original building was a non-designated heritage asset um there's another appeal where we've had this reference and the inspector has not agreed with with officers so there's a bit of work i think um as officers we need to do to actually fully appreciate the definition of non-designated heritage assets and in fact one of our officers um the L, who's the, one of the conservation officers, has actually done some work on that. So that's something that we will be looking at over the next uh, few weeks. Um, it was also felt by the inspector that it would overwhelm the form of the of, of the of the original uh, dwelling and would be out of character. Um, our supplementary planning document, um, on which provides guidance for the JLP indicates that we don't really want to, more than 50% enlargement. This was larger than 50%. Um, and um, and, and uh, it didn't actually reflect, the, the, the design of the extension didn't reflect the post dwelling in any way. So then just this. Next one is a permission in principle application, which is where um, it's a little bit like an outline, but it's in that it's actually trying to establish whether or not uh, permission principle should be granted. Um, there's very limited information that's received on not such applications. And then there's a, a follow-up stage two where they the applicant can submit um, technical details. So um, it's, it's different, a completely different type of application, but again, originally refused and then dismissed the appeal. Um, this is... The, so the site um, photo, aerial photograph is in here. Um, the application was uh, for a dwelling and an in principle decision on a dwelling, and the it was um, identified as not being a sustainable location um, because of the lack of facilities in uh, Lou Down, um, but and not Lou Down, sorry, Lifton Down. Um, and the um, and it also suggested that it wouldn't meet a locally identified housing need. Um, the inspector agreed with the uh, location and suggested that um, again the private car would be the predominant mode of travel. Um, a dwelling on this site would be likely to enhance, would not be likely to enhance uh, vitality of rural communities. On the housing need issue. Um, the inspector disagreed with the officers and felt that there was no reason why a single dwelling could not support the requirements of policy dev, dev eight. Um, and in fact, it's something that could be considered at the technical detail stage. We often use policy dev eight at, so in this case, at the permission in principle stage or for any other development at the outline stage, because it's whether or not the principle can be accepted. Um, and the principle of a or bedroom, three bedroom, two bedroom dwelling, whether that can be accepted on the site. But with the permissions in principle, we don't have that information. So, it's, so we, so um, yeah, uh, the the inspector didn't really agree with the officer on on basis. Then the final one um, is uh, uh, an application for the erection of a dwelling um, on Glanville Road, number twenty two. The site already has permission for a dwelling. And this was a uh, this was a request to make that dwelling larger, um, and again refused, dismissed the appeal. So the site is here, and in here. That's the site layout. So that's the original house, which is this house. This is the proposal, um, proposed application, and the it was refused because of the size scale of that building in relation to the size of the plot um, again size matting um, and it, it, the site lies within the Tavistock conservation area the world heritage site um, and there are listed buildings also uh, within the setting as well as non-designated heritage assets so that was the one of the main reasons for refusal and then also lack of low carbon information again interestingly the inspector agreed on the scale matters but uh, and also the um, negative impact it would have on the conservation area, um, uh, and did and and didn't feel the public benefits of the scheme would um, outweigh the harm 
that was generated to the conservation area, but did not consider that it affected the significance or outstanding universal value of the World Heritage Site. And the basis of that was on the basis that he that, that they didn't feel that the um, that site in particular had any mining relevance, and therefore it didn't have the uh, it didn't it, there was no no reason for it to impact on the World Heritage Site. So. Um, which was another interesting uh, view and, and be quite a supportable view. Um, the inspector did think it would have a harmful effect on the trees within the site. All of the properties along Glanville Road at that the bottom half have got quite verdant um, garden areas. Um, so he felt that that, that that would have an impact, but also didn't agree with us in terms of the impact on neighbours and felt that the fallback position for this one was the previous approval that had no carbon reduction measures in it. So they could, in effect, have built that one, and therefore he didn't feel that it was a, a very a satisfactory reason for refusal on that basis. That's it. It was just that it's, I've always had this sort of dichotomy between conservation area and world heritage. It's just, it's dawned on me some time ago that to affect the World Heritage Site or to have a mining implication. I think that there was, a, there was another planning application up further in Glanville where it was considered that the houses were railway related and not mining related. And it's a very, very tricky one that. Okay, um, any other questions on appeals? Right, we move on to the last item on the agenda, which is the undetermined major applications. Um, I see our our old friend, the Wool Grading Centre, remains. Twenty nineteen application. Um, but I note the. Um, I very much appreciate the sort of additional comments in red that are now appearing on these to give us a indication of uh, what's going on. Do you want to talk to any of them in particular or just no, take questions if we're asked them? The only question I've got is one that's sort of not on here, just for our interest, is the retail store at Beer Alston that is deferred awaiting negotiations. We have a sort of time, time scale when that's likely to reappear? Um, so discussions have taken place, but as far as I'm aware, the um, Case officer is awaiting a response to those discussions from the applicant. Uh, Councillor Mann and then Councillor Moody. Um, yeah, I just had a question on the um, undetermined major application, which is 4440 OPA by Peter Whitehead at land adjacent to Baldwin Drive, Radford Way, Oakhampton. Um, the officer comment was that there was an appeal lodged against non determination. And now under consideration by PINS. A, I don't know who PINS is. And um, and and um, the other thing I just wanted to understand is what is non-determination and what does that mean from the perspective of for us as a planning committee? So a non-determination appeal is effectively when um, an applicant decides that the application has not been considered. Um, in the correct time and therefore can appeal to the inspector on that basis. Um, in this case, the applicant um, decided that he didn't, there's some negotiations going on in relation to the section 106 uh, proposed uh, for this application. He didn't want to engage in that process, so he takes it to appeal against non-determination. What that means is it takes it out of our hands to deal with it um, and it goes to the planning inspectorate which are the the, the, the organisation that deal with appeals, and so it will go to it goes to them, um, and um, we have to make representations to them on the basis of the application still that we've had we have but can't determine, and they they then determine the application. So, so my I guess my question is, does that mean that that housing application in Oakhampton, which is 60 houses, that's quite a lot, is going to be determined by the National Planner because we were delayed on our response? Or is that just because they failed to, I don't I don't understand how we get into a position where 
we lose the ability to have the say on a major application like that. So, so if we don't make a decision within the statutory time scale, then the then the any applicant has the right to um, make a um, make a non determination appeal. In this case, um, the application had gone beyond the statutory time scale by quite a long time because of the negotiations that were needed with it. Initially, the application, so for example, one of the issues was the de description of development in that the, um, the description of development said around 60 dwellings. Um, and often that, that that's a little bit vague. A description of development is quite key when further down the line, when if anybody wants to challenge a decision. Um, and um, so we asked for it to be changed to up to 60 um, and the applicant refused. And so there was lots of t comings and goings in terms of all of those sorts. And there's lots of other issues as well. So um, Section 106 agreement um, relied on a viability assessment. Um, the applicant carried out a viability assessment, which she submitted to the, the authority. And we then have that independently assessed by a another consultant and um, there was uh, a suggestion by in the applicant's version that the scheme wasn't viable with all of the requirements that we'd asked for so we'd asked for an education contribution uh, open space affordable housing um, and they suggested they couldn't the scheme wasn't viable if they had to pay all of the contributions whereas our consultant said it was viable um, with of those contributions. Um, so that it was at that point that the applicant decided to. The jury and then comes. Unless uh, my colleague would like to come back with another question on that. I was going to ask a hypothetical question based on that discussion. I guess the only the only question I had is how do we protect ourselves as a council? against having something taken out of our hands. And if we are in need of additional resource or in order to be able to handle that application in a timely manner, is that something that we need to be discussing as a council? Because I, I, I hate to see a local application go up to a planning inspector when obviously there are clearly valuable things that we need to be saying about it that now we're going to be arguing to somebody who really knows nothing about West Devon. So I just, I guess that's my question. How do we prevent this happening? So for a major application, which this is, we have 13 weeks statutorily set by the government. We haven't got a choice about that to determine it. For a major application, that's a really short time scale. Very rare. We might get a few out within the 13 weeks, but it's very rare that we get every application out because there's lots of issues to discuss um, and um, the answer to your question is we should deal with all with them all within 13 weeks and then they can't appeal against non-determination that's the answer reality is somewhat different and um, yeah not necessarily possible I think it's high time for a hypothetical question <laughs> councillor jury thank you so my hypothetical question is if there is an applicant who we feel is delaying yeah. engaging with us and not progressing the application in this way as a means perhaps of engineering getting an appeal to pins should we refuse it and set out the grounds for our refusal which at this point would be quite lengthy and thorough so that pins have a chance to see exactly what we're trying to deal with is that the right tactic it is a tactic that we could can employ and do employ in some situations. Our planning charter um, says for all applications, we should determine it based on what they've originally submitted. And often there's a requirement through the process for additional information. And our officers are very clear that actually they should be refusing it or asking the application applicant to withdraw it until they can submit the, the sufficient information. So we are doing that in most cases, majors unfortunately don't fit as neatly into that but yeah on the whole we are doing that that's a moody thank you chair um hazelden prep school 
Uh, where are we with that now? Because that's been going on for quite some time. And I thought at some stage we were going to, it's coming to committee, you know, I had heard. So are we still negotiating? So it was due to come to the last committee, um, but the applicant asked for a deferral uh, in order to um, deal with the conservation officer's comments. Um, that thing, um, and ideally I'd wanted to bring it to this committee. However, Stephen Stroud, who's the case officer, was unable to make this meeting. Um, and also, um, Alex Rehag, who is the, uh, the affordable housing uh, lady within the council, is also not able to come either. And um, uh, oh, that's for case officer. Okay. Yes, yes. So just Stephen Stroud couldn't attend this meeting. He had a different. So is it so, coming to the next meeting? Yes. Be at the main. I shan't be at. I have an interest. I'm sure you'll be able to join in on Zoom from Australia. Uh, I had one sort of closing comment, and that is, um, unless it's my imagination, the, the number of undetermined major applications seems to be growing. Um, normally it's down to one sheet, and now it's two. I mean, am I am I right in that? Are we getting? Are we in danger of getting a bit of a backlog of yeah. determined majors? I think we are a few oldies. Don't go away, <laughs> <laughs> which we which we obviously need to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> I hope this bit isn't being recorded. <laughs> Um, and the um, and we've had a we've had like a bit of a um, surge in applications over the last I would say two months of majors. Sometimes we don't get many, um, and I think for a period of time before Christmas that wasn't happening. We weren't getting many, but now we've got quite a few. Um, and so yeah, we've um, got a new officer actually who started with us, who sat at the back of the room. Adrian, who is a new uh, principal officer, um, so he will help us move some of these um, pages forward. And um, the last time I I, um, I asked, which was some time ago, I think, um, the number of uh, non-major applications, ordinary applications, was a bit lower this year than it had been traditionally. Is that the, I mean, are the, are the two sort of in any way balancing each other out or are we getting an increase in the ordinary applications as well as majors? I don't think the numbers are actually that far out. I think we're getting less majors and more minors and householders. So I don't in terms, in terms of overall numbers, we're not we're not that different. Um, okay. Uh, any other questions on undetermined majors? In which case, I draw the meeting to a close. Thank you very much.